All right, so um, welcome back to another tutorial. Um, I don't know why I'm starting with this. I, I'm just kind of pissed off at stuff right now. Um, and I'm deciding to channel that into um, being more productive with, I don't know, artwork and tutorials and all that kind of stuff. Um, but this was funny. Um, so there's this unsubstantiated rumor. I mean, it's the morning after, right? I mean, there was the, the presidential election and... Um, uh, <laughs> so Trump wins, and um, this rumor goes around that Harambe got whatever fifteen thousand votes, twenty thousand votes, and all that kind of nonsense. And and it's not true. It was just um, just sort of one of those things that gets passed around. Um, but I don't know what people are so angry about. I mean, you know, sixty what was it? Sixty million Republicans got to vote for an orangutan. So I don't see what the the big deal is about. Uh, the rest of us are other people voting for Harambe. Uh, I can't vote. I'm Canadian. Anyways, um, no, I just thought that was funny and uh, doesn't really have any place in this tutorial, so I'll probably, probably edit all that out. Anyways, um, so today we're going to look at um, uh, isometric drawing inside of Inkscape and... Uh, yeah, I know there's a bunch of um, videos out there already for isometric drawing, showing how to do it. I'm just going to go through how um, I go about it, but also show how it can be incorporated inside of a game engine like Construct 2. So, I've got Inkscape open, Control shift d uh, brings up Document Properties, and so now we've got our grids. And um, so, it just says regular grid, we want to change that to axonometric. So that's going to give us our isometric grid, we say new. It gives us way too many uh, grid lines. So right now it says major grid line every five. We'll change that to no, every 35. And uh, that gives gives me something that I find easier to work with. So um, yeah, we can just we could just go right ahead and draw our isometric cube or isometric shape or whatever it is we want to whatever we want to draw. Um, I'm going to do um, side by side or one surface by surface and the reason for that um, I'll show you in a moment I like to be able to differentiate each side the light is going to be hitting each one a little bit differently so we'll take our time creating each. Um, I also like to put uh, gradients on um, pretty much any surface I create because it's very rare that light is going to be uniformly hitting uh, any surface even if it's a flat surface um, there's going to be some gradation across it so I'm going to turn off now the uh, the grids because uh, if I leave them on then my uh, my handles for the for the um, gradient are going to try to snap to the corners of the grid you can turn that off over here um, but I just find it easier to turn off the grid completely. So, in keeping with the idea that light doesn't flow uniformly across the surface, um, I might lighten one edge or another. And likewise, I like to play with the colors a little bit as they, as they move across the surface. It creates some interest. Um, so I'll make this edge a little bit lighter as well and um, just change the hue a little bit move it this way and then the darkest edge um, add some more more purples there maybe a little bit higher saturation you can play with all three I'm um, the light and dark um, the hue and then also the saturation all of them are going to work to provide bit more interesting of a shape. So there we go. There's our isometric cube and um, and isometric drawing has been called 2.5D uh, drawing and uh, it's not quite 3D so I duplicate this, I move it ahead, duplicate, move ahead. We are creating depth in the image um, but if it was a true 3D image then I mean each each of these cubes that's further away from the viewer, so further away from you each of them should be getting a little bit smaller uh, with isometric drawing that doesn't happen so it's not quite uh, not quite 3D realistic but it's still a nice way to um, 
to illustrate a concept and it's also uh, a popular kind of or used to be much more popular way of creating game environments it's sort of come back a little bit um, in some games uh, wasteland 2 uh, pillars of eternity uh, but goes back to some of the classics like Hubert anyways so I, I'm gonna just create a little shadow not a little one long shadow for this guy send it to the back and <clears throat> there we go so um, I've got a relatively well, I won't call it interesting, it's pretty simple. Um, keeping in mind, you can of course then go on to um, do any sort of additions you want to this this shape. Maybe it's a container. You know, you can add details as you go. But I'm just keep it, gonna keep it as a cube. Keep it simple. I'm gonna export, <laughs> export both of these shapes and um, and this is a neat thing inside of Inkscape. So um, Inkscape, you can see over here, it's got the um, the dimensions. I click on the cube, and Inkscape is thinking maybe I want to export it at 243 width and um, 600 pixels width for the shadow. It's just going, I think, based off the um, the size of the page. But this is kind of neat. So I'm going to export. Um, let's choose to the desktop because you know best practice um, so I want to export it much smaller we'll go uh, 120 so we say export and now the shadow that was going to export at 600 uh, pixels now see it says 300 pixels this I think is cool uh, you know Inkscape is intuitive about uh, if you export a shape at one one size it then figures okay maybe you want to proportionately export other shapes at um, at, a, at a relative size so I, I don't know I just think that that's kind of cool with Inkscape so um, exported both those the the shape and its shadow uh, go into construct and create our new empty project and now we're gonna bring both of those in so I'll bring the shadow in first it just saves me a step I don't have to think about uh, moving it to the back um, in the Z order because as you export newer objects they uh, they appear higher up in the Z order so just saves one extra step so I've got my <laughs> if you can call this a game environment I've got uh, the beginning of my game environment um, I turn off scaling I have no idea why it defaults to scaling but anyways uh, I hit F5 and there we go <laughs> there's my my game and it's a pretty crappy one okay so uh, construct 2 runs on the behavior system so we're gonna give the cube a behavior and that behavior is solid we don't want enemies we don't want players um, moving through the cube on the screen but of course we want them moving across or over the shadow that's no no big deal um, but the cube is now solid and we have to set where the where the boundary points are um, and we do not want this so we're gonna change this this is something to um, to keep in mind um, I want a player or other objects to be able to pass in front of the cube so if I have things like this everything gets stopped the second it touches any edge so I want to leave some space up front and there we go so a player can um, can pass in front of this area here but can't uh, can't run through the cube so there and now we need a player so Let's create our player. Yeah, come on, there we go. Yeah, I don't know 
know if I want green there, darker shade of green, perfect. Okay, I'm gonna duplicate that and let's give him a pair of blinking eyes. We'll use red because as red green colorblind people like myself will tell you, it's always wonderful when people use red and green together. So, uh, we go loop that. Yeah, come on. There we go. Uh, loop that. Here's our player. <laughs> and uh, we'll give him eight direction movement, which means essentially that um, the directional arrows on the keyboard can now control this this character. Um, <laughs> so we'll hit just start it up. And there he is, blinking eyes and all. So he moves around and he gets blocked when he hits that cube. So he can he can pass in front a little bit. So that's cool. But you'll see that um, the cube nevertheless sort of becomes this uh, barrier, this obstacle for for the player and potentially for, for other objects in the game. Um, we could copy and put that out a few times. Uh, make the player a little bit smaller just to show better. And uh, there we go. So we play this now. And we've got a maze for the, the player to run. Um, I didn't reset the player's Z order, so actually he's gonna he's gonna turn out behind. Yeah, he disappears behind each of these objects. So actually, let's let's do that again. Let's just bring him to the top. And there we go. So he can get up close to, but can't pass those barriers. And then if you want to get more in-depth into this, um, I mean, you might want the player being able to pass behind the cube, but then you're going to run into those uh, Z-order problems. Um, so that would be a thing where you would write um, an event where essentially whenever the, the player's um, Y-axis uh, was lower than, because the Y-axis starts at zero, and increases. So whenever the player's y-axis is lower than a particular instance of a cube, you set the uh, player's uh, z-order to the background, and then whenever the player's uh, y-axis exceeds the cube's y-axis, you bring the player uh, to the front. You set an event that does that. Uh, anyways, I hope you have found that helpful. Um, have any questions, leave them in the comments section. And any ideas about what you want to see next, um, yeah, go ahead and leave that there as well. Okay, thanks a lot.